All right, so we're going to stay on the theme of, especially as, uh, as we uh, um, get into the holiday season or the Christmas season, that's usually the only time I ever see this word. And Sydney's out here today, you know, so I can't make fun of the King James thing. But behold, we never, we never really use this word. But I mean, I don't know if you use this word, but I don't use this word in normal English. But behold, you guys know what the rest of it is? What has what our theme been? There you go. Uh, Todd said your, um, but I'm going to say our God. Behold our God. And what we're seeing in Scripture is this is the message of Scripture. This is what the, the story is, both in a small, you know, kind of the, the micro pieces and the macro pieces, okay? This is all about this idea of, of God convincing us and persuading us that he's a good God. And that's the message. That's the message, and I, I wanted to just kind of, um, again, I guess it's kind of review, but with Jeff being in Romans, that's how Paul laid out the beginning of Romans. He says in Romans 1, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And he lays it out right from the beginning that he is there to proclaim, there's another weird word, proclaim um, this message of look at your look at our God, look at your God, and look at the good the good news about our God. And so again, this morning, and this is equally as important for me as it is for you that we're here on Sunday morning to remind ourselves of this again, and just to look at Scripture to see how Scripture did, does this. And, and just in, in a simplistic way, when I'm staying in, in Isaiah, we're going to read from Isaiah 52 and 53, and look at how, um, look at how God presents himself, because again, it's... It's, it's unlike what humans would do. It, it's, in a, I, it's weird, it, and it's a curveball. And the, the more I'm in Scripture, the more I realize God, God throws these curveballs all the time. I, I, don't, why do I, I just realized, why do I say curveball? You guys get the picture there? Why do I... Yeah, it's, it, it surprises you. It's counter to kind of normal thinking, okay? So what we think God is saying often ends up being something very different. And so we're going to see that this morning in Isaiah chapter 52 and 53. But I just wanted to um, kind of rehash again this idea of the gospel. It's this proclamation of the good news, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, and it's done in different ways from different angles. I believe God does that. On purpose, and he uses the, the story of human life specifically to show us himself. And the reality is, it's human or, or life provides the um, the context. It provides the you know, in terms of art, what's the big thing we draw on? It it, it provides the background. It provides. Um, it's the only way we can see it. But again, God does it in a very different way. So this, this idea of uh, that Paul says, hey, he, all he's here to do and what he's doing in Romans is he's, he, he is showing us the good news of our God. Um, and I talk about curveballs. You know, in uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So... To, to normal human, to the, to the normal human heart, to normal human thinking, the message of the cross is foolishness. And we, we talked about this weeks ago. I mean, just saying that the message of the cross or the picture of the cross is foolishness to normal thinking. And why is it foolishness? I mean, what's the cross? Just the opposite of what we are or we would ever do. It's the opposite of what we'd ever do. We'd never show our glory. Remember, we talk a lot about glory. We talk a lot about, was it another word we use? Power. So power, glory. God, you know, we talk extensively about God specifically chose the cross to glorify himself. 
that is not normal human thinking. Matter of fact, to me, just that statement in and of itself, to me, proves there's a God. Because in nor humans wouldn't come up with that idea that I'm gonna I'm gonna show my glory and my power by allowing my creation, my creatures, to put me to death on a cross. That's stupid. That's why Paul says it's foolishness. Because humans, what, what's the story we create regarding glory and power? Put them on a pedestal. I'm going to come in on the big, huge, strong horses, showing my strength, showing my might, um, displaying my power, displaying my glory in this grand way, whereas God decides to show his... And again, it's both and, because we're going to see this in, in, um, in Isaiah... God does show his glory and might in a grand way, and how? We see this in the, in the beginning of Romans. How does God say that it, his power and his glory, his power specifically, is evident to everybody? Through what? Creation. Through creation. If, you, if anybody is paying attention to creation and looks just a little bit at the, the miraculous, powerful aspects of creation... If you really dive into that, it, it, it can and will blow your mind because it, it's, it's almost unbelievable the intricate detail and the power that is in creation. And as we know as Christians, as scripture tells us, that when God creates a miracle within us, even believe that he's real, then you look through that creation and say, it's got to be created by something. There's, there's no other explanation for it. And so therefore, God uses creation and says, hey, my power is evident just in what's been, been made, that everybody knows that there is a God, okay? So there's that piece that we know is real, the, the power aspect that we humans normally think of, and the glory that we normally think of, but yet specifically God chose to, to display his glory and his power in the cross. And it's wrapped up in this good news, the message of the good news of Christ, and that being that he's here to save us from ourselves. And we've talked about this over and over again, okay? It's not, he didn't come to save us from some random sin that's out there, or bad people, or evil, or even the devil and demons. No, he came to deliver us from ourselves, from our own hearts. So it's this, this message of the good news that is, you know, that, that it's really is foolishness to, to those uh, who are perishing, is what, he's, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Um, I don't think I need to, I, I guess a couple of verses that we talked about before, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9, Isaiah writes, Go up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Raise your voice loudly, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. And again, that's the theme that we're seeing. Behold your God, here is your God. And again, at that point in time, we talked about this before, at that point in time, what's going on with the people who are hearing this message? This is a quick reminder. This is Isaiah, the prophet, speaking to the Hebrews of his time. And, and what's going on, or what's happening in the context. So they're under, they're either in captivity, or they're under the threat of captivity, just overpowered, overwhelmed by the, the holy force of the Tyrians. Yeah, so they're, they're just weakened and vulnerable, and threatened, and either under it, or anointing under you know, the time of the state. Yeah, so at the time, it doesn't look like God is in charge, or their God is in charge. It doesn't look like the promises of Scripture that they knew so well were, were happening because they were under duress. In, in a sense, um, yeah, they were under a, a, a lot of bad things were going on. Um, so Isaiah is saying this, say, say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. And then Isaiah chapter 52, which is where I want to read from, Isaiah chapter 52, um, verse 7 says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim the salvation, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, 
your God reigns, or our God reigns. So again, here's this message that to the human mind and logic of the time, if we were sitting there listening to these words of Isaiah at that point in time, we, we'd be craving these things right here. We'd be craving peace, because there was no peace. We'd be, we'd be craving salvation, but what kind of salvation? From the bad guys. The human kind. Patrick said from the bad guy. So that's why I said the human kind. We're craving we're human salvation. What's that? <laughs> we're, obviously we're obviously the good guys. Again, this is the, the you know, the hilarity of human thinking, you know, and thinking that I'm I'm the good guy, those are the bad guys, and we need to be saved from those bad guys. But that's what they're thinking, because they're under duress. They're, they're, they're possibly in enslavement or in some kind of captivity, and they're believing that they're being oppressed by the bad guy, okay? So they're looking for salvation. So again, I, I would say it's a whole fan, but we know, now that we know the whole story, this is talking about, I say both and, both salvation from the bad guy, humanly speaking, but even deeper than that, or especially deeper than that, that they don't really recognize yet, it's salvation from who, or from what? Themselves, the real bad guy, okay? So um, Isaiah says, how beautiful are on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. So I'm going to read, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to read all of Isaiah 52 and 53, but we're, I, I want to just kind of make some observations as we go through. So again, kind of how does this strike you as just, you know, what, what do you, what do you think of when certain things are said or certain pictures are created in your mind as we read some of this stuff? both from normal human thinking, and then we're going to see, as we get to Isaiah 53, the curveball that God gives us, okay? That, that obviously the people during this time probably wouldn't have met, I mean, I don't know, we'll, we'll talk about it and see how, uh, where this goes, but let's read this. So starting with um, chapter 52 of Isaiah, verse 1, Isaiah writes, Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion, put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For there shall no more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake yourself from the dust and arise. Be seated, O Jerusalem. Loose the bonds from your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Okay, so again, we just talked about the context of Isaiah, because they're, they're in a sense, they're captive in their own land. There's oppressors in their own land, and they're looking for salvation. And just in those words right there, what... what does anything strike you as far as from a human perspective? Or what, what strikes you from those, just in those words right there? Why did they use the word daughter of Zion? Um, let me see. I need those glasses, Ronnie. Put those on the list for Costco. Um, <laughs> where is that? Uh, first oh, well, captive daughter of Zion. Um, I... I think often, from a from a grammatical and, and poetic standpoint, they kind of. I think it's often like the the nation is referred to in the uh, feminine in the feminine. Um, you know, even throughout the Old Testament, when God often calls Israel His bride. I mean, it's just often it, that's just the way. That especially, I think, in that poetry, they referred to, um, now, why did God do that? I, I, you know, we could probably talk a lot about that, but especially that idea of his bride. So he re is referring to his people as his bride, okay? So I, I think that's just a normal, um, th that happens all through the Old Testament, especially in the, um, in the prophets. Any, anything else? Just to begin with, with that, yeah. Yeah, it seems to have the focus on the external bad guys for the, the uncircumcised and the unclean, talking about those guys. It seems like oh, it's that more that theme than the, than the sin theme. Isn't that interesting? 
Again, you'll, you see a lot of the both and in Scripture. Okay, it's not either or, but both and. But it is interesting, because right, right away, it seems to have, or, or it brings to mind this external focus, or, or even, or especially, what is happening externally, not necessarily internally. So, yeah, that's, that's, uh, I'm glad you brought that up, because that, that's absolutely true. But then let's just see how this develops. So then in verse 3, For thus says the Lord, You were sold for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, my people went down at first into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them for nothing. Now therefore, what have I here, declares the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing, their rulers wail, declares the Lord, and continually all the day my name is despised. Okay, so what again, what, what strikes you? What's he talking about? bringing to mind still kind of the external, right? The reality of what's happening. They're being oppressed, and he's he's saying he hears their cry. Remember, you remember what we've talked about before? I, I've talked about it as being what I believe is, is the basic aspect of salvation that I think I, I see in all of Scripture, is this idea that God hears when, when people recognize their need for help and they cry out to God, what does God do? He helps. And, and the message through Scripture is God is waiting to hear their cry for help because the normal human mind thinks what regarding help most of the time? Do it myself. By myself. Remember the toddler mentality? Myself. No, me, mine. I can do it myself, okay? Even, even, you know, think about the toddler, they often will cry for help, but it, it is more a demand for a certain kind of help, okay, that they think that they need. But yet there's this reality that God shows us that, and it's part of him and his persuasion of showing his people that he is good. In essence, he's letting us come, he, he's... He's letting us, he's bringing us to an end of ourselves to where, where we finally just throw up our hands and say, I can't do it anymore. I, I, I need the help of from, from where my help comes from. Okay, so anyway, so he says, I think it's still kind of, you know, bringing to mind the external, the reality of what, what the people are going through. So the, he even calls, he says that, 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 uh, that the rulers wail, they cry, and even says, and continually, all the day, my name is despised. Mine says blaspheme. Blaspheme? Do you have any idea a why? A little different kind of A little thing. different. Despise, blasphemes, yeah. Um, any other words that are used differently in, in your translations? Both of them, what, what do you think? Again, it's calling to mind what is actually happening. And if, and if you've done any kind of research and kind of the history of religion, especially in this day and age, I'm talking about the um, Old Testament day and age, um, What? why is God's name being despised or blasphemed at this point in time, as far as why he's saying this? Again, it, it'll give you an indication as to what's going on in the external piece again. So they're being subjugated. So God's people are being subjugated. They're being oppressed. So why would God's name be blasphemed? Or blaming him. So Todd just said they're blaming him. So the people of God are blaming him. And in a sense, blasphemed that way. That's the reality of probably what's going on. Also, the surrounding areas that are subjugating them are saying that your God isn't very powerful. See, so that, that's the history of religion piece, okay? Those people had proof, positive, that the God you claim is real is not a God or he's not very strong because look at you guys. You're a captive, you're oppressed, and so therefore any, any God of the peoples, whoever was the strong man, their God was the strong one. Their God was, the, was proved to be right and correct and real, and, and the gods of the people who were being oppressed were obviously weak gods. Okay, so there, there's this piece that there's the reality of human thinking again, is that God, again, our God, we know looking at the story, we know that 
he's he's intimately involved in this, isn't he? He's, in a sense, and I, I don't know why I say in a sense, he's allowed it to happen. And again, why would God allow that to happen to his people? Well, usually it's because they're not doing what they're supposed to do. They're not following the laws he set out for them, and they're going their own way, and even incorporating the other gods into their own religion and home. Okay, it's exactly the toddler mentality that I just, that just, just described, okay? The people thought that they were helping themselves. If you think about the, the, um, the history of the Israelites, God delivered them from slavery in Egypt, in captivity, says, I'm your God. He says, I'm going to be your king. You don't need a human king. What's the first thing that the Israelites did as soon as they went into the promised land? We need a king. We want a human king. And they thought they knew what they needed or wanted. And so in a very real sense, God goes, oh, okay. I'm telling you, it's going to be bad for you. I'm telling you that right off the bat, guys. It's going to be bad for you. Matter of fact, you know, if you don't, if you don't remember, he brought to mind... He told them, hey, don't you realize what human kings do? I mean, just look at the people. Look at the, the countries that are surrounding you. You guys, I'm just letting you know, you realize this is what the human kings do, do to you, okay? They're going to take your sons and your daughters. They're going to take your money. They're going to do this. They're, gonna, they're in a sense, going to oppress you. And, and the people said, hey, hey, don't worry about that, okay? We know what we're doing. All right, thanks, God. But that's the human mentality. So therefore, God let them go their own way. Again, it's... It's a beautiful pic. It's terrible. <laughs> it's a terrible, beautiful picture to where God shows us from a country perspective what he's doing for us and to us individually as well. Okay, so we see this happen from a nation standpoint to where the nation goes, thanks God, we got this. Hey, we'll let you know when we need help. Okay, we want a king. And, and God goes, okay, I'm gonna let you do what? What you think is good. And again, the whole time, God is still using that disaster to eventually show his people that he is indeed good. And that's the whole, what Isaiah is doing here, is he's saying, behold your God. And again, it's done in a, in a, in a crazy way. But God, he, God recognizes and he's saying and proclaiming that this is what's going on. Okay, so he's, he's, he is talking about the externals here and what's happening from a human perspective. And he says in verse 8, Therefore, my people shall know my name. Which is really interesting when you think about this in light of what you just said. That even the Israelites, or you, should, you could say especially the Israelites. You know why the Israelites incorporated the other gods from around them? Because, yeah, they're looking at this saying, this is a disaster. How do, how do I reconcile that, that our God has said this, because they had scripture at that time, that our God has said this, but yet, when I look around me, none of it's true. I mean, that's what they think. Okay? So what God says, so that's why. I mean, we, we, can, we can despise the Hebrew people in a way, especially when we think about the, you know, if you've grown up in the church and you think about how, you know, normal, normal preachers have taught about idolatry and false gods and all of those things and how bad the Hebrews were for you know, going after the, the false gods, well, it was just logical, okay? Because they're looking at their scenario and they're saying, how does this make any sense? It doesn't make any sense. So I'm going to try these other things in a desperate attempt for hope and life and everything else. But yet, meanwhile, God continues to work and, and, and show how he is going to persuade his people despite themselves, okay? So he says, which is interesting, he says, therefore, my people shall know my name. And therefore, in that day, they shall know that it is I who speak. And he says, here am I. Because again, it doesn't seem like it at, at that point in time, okay? And then, then this is where he says through Isaiah, the, the scripture passage that we just read a minute ago, Isaiah 52, verse 7. He says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes uh, salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Again, it makes sense now, doesn't it? Because they're thinking he isn't reigning. They're thinking he isn't around. They're thinking that he's weak, that he's absent, or, you know, 
all, all kinds of different ways that people think about God. They're looking at their situation. They're not believing it. And then here comes the prophet that's saying, you know what? God's going to show you. God, and, and again, who's the actor here? It's God. And that's the incredible good news here, too. It's not, it's not the people. It's not anybody else. It's God saying, okay, I'm seeing what's happening, and I'm letting you guys know I'm going to show you myself. Again, this idea of behold, behold your God or behold our God. And God says, hey, your God reigns. It says in, in verse 8, the voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy, for eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, uh, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Now again, if you're sitting there at that point in time, what are you thinking right now? I mean, what do these words do to you? It sounds terrific. But, uh, <laughs> a little shaky right now. <laughs> Why shaky? A lot of bad things going on. But it does. It sounds terrific, doesn't it? It sounds like God is, is finally going to make himself known. And it's going to be grand. Right? I mean, that's what it sounds like. It is. I mean, it's what he's saying. He, I mean, he just said, people, I mean, the watchmen are gonna lift up their voice, they're gonna sing for joy. It says, I need those glasses. <laughs> um, it says, all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And again, the external focus, salvation. I mean, kind of primarily sounds like the deliverance and salvation of his people from the oppression of, the, of, of what they're under, okay? And again, it's both and. I'm not trying to, to say it's not one and it's some, some other, but again, let's see how this unfolds. But it sounds grand, doesn't it? I say, I use that word on purpose. It sounds, it sounds um, big. It sounds exciting. It sounds like, I mean, what does it sound like? What, is it, what does it feel like to you when you hear those words? Come on, it's not a quiz question. It sounds hopeful. Peace, happiness, I mean, it sounds good. It's, a, it's exactly what me as a human at that point in time, at this point in time, wants. I want peace. I want happiness. And God is proclaiming he's going to bring it. And it sounds, I, I keep using the word grand, it sounds like it's going to be this visible, triumphant display of power and glory. You know, the same words that we've used before. Because how else do you do that? You know, being oppressed by bad guys. Sounds like God's going to come in and wipe out the bad guys, right? And, and restore, and again, the, the people have in their mind the Old Testament, okay? The, the, the Torah, the, the words that Moses had written, the words that Moses had proclaimed in Deuteronomy, where he's talking about the promised land and and bringing about this, this land and this kingdom where God is going to reign and, and his people, in essence, again, this is how it appeals to the human mind, are reigning with them. They're, they're the good guys. They're the powerful guys. They're ruling the earth. Okay, that, that's, the, that's what's bringing, you know, bringing to mind or bringing into their mind um, as far as these words. So we'll keep on going. Verse 11, depart, depart, go out from here, or from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her. Purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. For you shall not go out in haste, and you shall not go out, uh, go in flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Again, it sounds grand, doesn't it? Sounds like a big procession. It, it, He's bringing to mind, even right there, I mean, what, what that makes me think of, where it's talking about you bear the vessels of the Lord, talking about the Lord going in front of them. It, talks, it brings to mind, you know, uh, what was said about um, kind of the, the temple and the, and, and the holy things that God had told them to make and, and, to, and, and to use in remembrance of him. And even the procession, and I'm thinking about how they, 
were moving to the promised land and, and how God was going before them, you know, with the, the pillar of smoke in the day and the and the fire by night, okay? It, that's pretty grand and pretty amazing. And so you're, I, I, that's what it's bringing to, to mind to me, especially knowing the context of the time. And even there it says, it's interesting, it says, the Lord will go before you and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. I mean, from a military strategy standpoint, even now, the way we function in the military from a small unit and a large unit is you're always protecting, you always have to protect your rear guard because that's what the enemy is trying to get to your rear. That sounds funny out loud, but because, you know, your, your weapons, they even talk about the point of the spear, the, the bad stuff, the dangerous stuff is up front because the enemy's up front. So that the enemy knows that. So I, the enemy would rather not attack the front because that's where the bad stuff is, okay? So they're trying to figure out how to get to the, to the rear. But God says, not only am I in front of you leading the way, but I'm your rear guard as well. So it just, it just, it all sounds grand. It all sounds fantastic. But one thing God also told them is to purify themselves. And otherwise, clean your act up. I'll be there with you. Clean your act up. And that's what they're not doing. That's what we're not doing. So consequently, this is what you get when you don't <coughs> hear the Lord and his yeah, you know, that's exactly correct, which which should blow our minds when he says in in one of the other prophets talks about how um, talks about the, the the bones, the dry bones on the battlefield and the broken vessels and how he's using those uh, pictures in describing them that they can't create life, they can't they can't make themselves anything other than what they are. And, and then God proclaims, I'm going to put, I'm going to take out your heart of stone and I'm going to put in a heart of flesh. I'm going to make you alive. Okay, so there's all, all kinds of things. So you're right. There's these things that he's talking about, which, you know, I don't want to get too distracted there on why he says that. He, he does say it there, purify yourselves. It'd be interesting to see what the, the, the actual Hebrew word is talking about there. Um, but he, he is saying it. And there is this sense that, I guess it begs the question, why is he saying it? Is that, that's why I don't want to get bogged down here, because what we do know is God still acts. God still does it, even though, there, matter of fact, who's the one that has to purify? It's God that is the one that has to purify. God is the one that has to give them a new heart in order to even believe or obey anything, okay? But yeah, that, that's, that is interesting. But again, it's... What we see there, even that aspect of talking about purifying, it's got this kind of idea of the external, okay? Of the context of what's going on. So it brings to mind, you know, kind of the oppression, the, the bad guys that are out there, that they need to be saved and delivered in kind of this real physical sense, which is true. But then let's let's look, let's begin to look at the curveball, okay? And what God says next. And again, this is awesome as we move into the Christmas season, because we'll, we'll, we'll hear this passage uh, that's coming up. So he says, in verse 13, he says, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up, and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so... Now listen, now, now think about this now, because we know what he's, who and what Isaiah is talking about at this point in time. But if you think about the, the Israelites or the Hebrew people that are listening to this at this point in time, this is kind of, I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say confusing language, but it, it would almost seem, yeah, kind of the, the prophetic piece that we don't know what he's talking about at this point in time. And now think about the curveball here. We're just, we just hear God proclaim, hey, I'm going to make my name known. I'm going to come save you guys. Salvation's coming. Hope and peace is coming. Happiness is coming. I'm going to lead the way, and I'm going to guard your rear. Get ready to shout it from, from the mountaintops, Zion. Okay? And then he goes into this. He talks about his servant. And it says, as many were astonished at you. He says, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouth, mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see. And that which they have not heard, 
they understand. And then this passage that so many of us are familiar with says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Now, now just think about this for a second. Put this in contrast with what we just read. We just read this, I, I use the word grand, I mean this, this picture of a, a, an extremely powerful king that is proclaiming a promise to come save his people with power and glory, and all of a sudden we get this. This is a curveball and a half. To me, it's a curveball and a half. Of course, it, it just goes to show that, and this is, this is the good, he just talked about proclaiming the good news. And now we, we see these words, and, and we know he's talking about who? He's talking about Christ. He's talking about Jesus. The, um, the beginning there where it says, uh, verse 2, yeah, verse 2, where it says, For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. Um, this, this picture of a, of a plant, um, of a root springing up, is used as a, in, a, in the same context by, I think, all of the prophets. I know Jeremiah uses the same idea in, in this proclamation of, or promise of, the Messiah. It's used in direct uh, words or language in, in, in this promise of a Messiah, this new root, a root of Jesse, I think, that, Je, that Jeremiah uh, talks about it. But that, that picture of this plant sprouting up it is known throughout all of the, the prophets to be this picture of or promise of the Messiah. So we know he's talking about the Messiah. We know he's talking about Christ. But now all of a sudden, what, what do you, what's the feeling you get as you hear those words? I, I haven't finished yet, but come on, what do you think? Not grand. <laughs> not, not grand! Kind of strange, isn't it? Anything else? We had grand. Again, both and. I believe God is going to show us who he is one day, and we're going to, it's going to blow our, we're not going to need to wear socks, but it's going to blow our socks off. Okay? After every second that, that, from that point on, every second, our socks will be blown off because of how grand and incredible God is. Okay? But yet we just got grand, and now, and now it's something different. It's a curveball. It, it's not human. Again, it's these kinds of things that I say is proof that God exists. Because a human wouldn't have come up with this. Look at what else he says. It says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Again, that, that's showing normal human thinking right there. Again. You talk about purifying ourselves, but yet look what he says there. He says, this Messiah, this person that, that God is talking about, he's borne our griefs, he, he's, um, he's carried our sorrows, so that's what he's doing for us, but yet even while he's doing it, people are still, in essence, blaspheming him and despising him. And again, because of the same thing that we talked about before, that's not how humans think of God's. That's not the kind of king that a human would, would prop up or esteem. Because they're saying, hey, but yet you, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. And then this passage that we all know, it says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And again, we know this to be the ultimate good news, right? But to any normal human being, this is going to smack you in the face to go, 
What? I mean, it's not until God reveals to you how much you need him that this even makes any sense. It doesn't. It's foolishness, like Paul says in Corinthians. It really is. Because you're going to look at this and go, one, uh, I don't really have iniquity. The bad guys have iniquity. So if God's going to come save them, well, good, good. But I don't want them saved. They need to be punished. So, again, the normal human thinking, you look at this and go, this is stupid. Again, the supernatural thing that happens in us, the miracle that happens in us to go, this is what I need. I, and this is where he starts to go. In, he's, he's hitting them squarely between the eyes because at first we're thinking it's external salvation, external deliverance from the bad guy, but then he's pointing this right at you, them, and saying, hey, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned our own way. Everyone to his own way. Again, in the context of the time, you're thinking, but, but, which is what people do, but, but, but the bad guys need to be done away with. They're the bad guys. It says, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And it says, he continues, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth. And this is interesting. Now think about this in light of our current situation. What do, what, what is a burning desire of people who are, are who are oppressed. To tell you about it. What other burning desires are there? Isn't that funny? To tell you about it. I'm oppressed. I'm going to tell everybody who's going to hear me, I am oppressed. What, what's the basic idea of oppressed? Unfair. It's unfair! <laughs> Guys, listen. There is, if there is one thing that is common to every human being, it's this internal burning and, and um, the when, when you when any human has felt that they have been dealt with unfairly they you can't shut your mouth just just use your kids you're the same way we just have learned how to do that in different ways again you look at our culture and what's happening nowadays with with politically I mean this is all we see is is this the message, the, the, the oppressed want to pro proclaim how they have been dealt an unfair hand. And, and, not, and not, it doesn't stop there. What else, what comes after that? Not only do we want to proclaim that this is not fair, what comes next? Others should be punished. Oh, man. Others need to be punished. The oppressor needs to be punished. Because this isn't any fair. This isn't fair. It's a slam dunk. The oppressed need to be punished, or the oppressor needs to be punished. And so it's really interesting. It says, he was oppressed, and he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth. Which is really interesting when you think about the, God, I say burning desire. I mean, it's like, I'm, again, I, I think about when I was a kid, I think about my own kids, when they think that it's something is not fair, they can't help but open their mouth. It, it, it's just like it's like an involuntary, an involuntary action. Am I the only one that thinks that? I mean, when's the last time you thought? You know, I mean, think about the last time. I'm trying to think. You know, when, when was the last time as an adult that I that I believed that you know something was unfair? I can't, I can't uh, remember like the exact thing, but I can remember the feeling. And I, I can remember the desire that I, I, need to, I need to clear my name. I need to, I need to, I need to make it known. <laughs> I need to open my mouth. It says, and yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that, that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And I'm going to have to stop there. Think about this. Think about the unfairness of what is being, pro, being shown right there. So the Messiah decides to take on your sin and my sin, your iniquity and my iniquity. He decides to take that on even though he doesn't deserve any of it. That's not fair. And yet he does it without opening his mouth. He doesn't even open his mouth to go, hey guys, I just want you to let you know, I'm taking this on for you guys, and you, you should like me for it. And by the way, it's not fair. It's not fair. No, he doesn't. It says he doesn't open his mouth. 
Doesn't even defend himself, what we know, because we know the story. He doesn't even defend himself when he's given the opportunity to defend himself. When he's given the opportunity to say, this isn't fair, this is wrong, and I'll tell you how to make it right. No, he, he, he's, he kept his mouth shut all the way to the cross. It's a different kind of king. It's a different kind of God, and this is, again, along with our theme here, behold our God. This is our God. This is our Messiah. And it is just is fascinating to me how these curveballs keep getting thrown as far as how God presents himself and how he proclaims the good news. And uh, we got to stop. Let me pray. Dear God, I thank you for this day. I thank you, as Jeff said earlier, for the, for the rain, for the fresh air, for life. And again, God, help us to persuade us more this morning, God, of uh, how good a God you are. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.